Thank you, Governor Brown. And with that uh, rousing speech, I'd like to invite to the stage some of the practitioners who have, are on the front lines representing uh, the world's, all of the world's most ambitious uh, carbon trading uh, regions. I'll introduce them once they get to the stage, but please join me in a round of applause. And please come on up. Um, so to my right is uh, Mary Nichols, who really needs no introduction uh, as the chair of the California Air Resources Board. Uh, to her right, Mauro <laughs> Petruccioni, director general uh, for climate at the European Commission, and Ambassador Patricia Fuller, um, the ambassador for climate change uh, in Canada. At the far end, we have um, Professor He Jiankun, uh, chairman of China's Advisory Committee on Climate Change and director of the Low Carbon Economy Lab at Tsinghua University. And Gerard Mestrelet, chairman of uh, Suez and Angie and uh, co-chair of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Thank you all for joining me today. Now, I'd like to begin just by asking you to give a short overview of the recent progress in your regions. Uh, California has a new energy bill. I know some of you were in Bangkok last week. Perhaps you can just bring us up to date quickly with the latest developments in, in your area. Mary, would you like to keep Well, uh, as people probably heard yesterday, uh, the governor signed new legislation which uh, is uh, putting California on track to go to a zero carbon electricity system uh, by 2045. And simultaneously with that, he signed an executive order, which puts that in some context and uh, puts the uh, state administration behind a new plan to uh, reduce overall emissions to a net carbon neutral situation so that we will be taking full advantage of our ability uh, as, a, as a state to absorb carbon and to find new ways to capture and, and reuse it, as, as he stated. Uh, we have uh, been successful in moving forward with our uh, cap and trade program uh, going back now for uh, a number of years. We've achieved uh, results which have kept us on track to meet our overall climate goals and also raised revenue uh, from the roughly 10% of the allowances that we uh, sell as a state and, and use for various programs that are designed to help mitigate and to uh, help uh, restore environmental uh, sustainability in some of our most disadvantaged communities. I think um, it's also important, though, to recognize that we haven't, it's not an unbroken march towards success. That is, um, this past year, uh, a state which had linked with us, um, state, uh, the province of Ontario in Canada, which had been uh, a member of our trading system, decided no longer to participate. Uh, I think uh, this was a sad fact for us that the politics of the election in that state caused them to reverse their position. But one thing that I want to stress, and I hope this will be something we can all talk about, is that we designed our program in a way that allowed for that to happen, so that when the decision was made by a member to withdraw from the market, we were able to quickly absorb that information, prevent it from having an impact on any of the trading or the market itself, and therefore, you know, move on in a way that showed that these programs can be implemented uh, without having to be uh, completely at the mercy of individual uh, elections in individual jurisdictions. So I just wanted to kind of raise that as a, you get that out in front as something that could be a negative, but can also show how these programs, if they're well designed and implemented, can be very resilient and successful as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And uh, Maru, in the, in the EU, you guys have seen the, your carbon price skyrocketing uh, recently. Is it going to keep going up? Thank you, Leslie. But first of all, let me say that how important this uh, week's event is and how proud and happy we are in the European Commission to be, to be part of it. We think it's extremely important to have this kind of events everywhere and involving not only 
states and countries, but also the uh, local authorities, the cities, the states, the provinces. Uh, look, I'll say three things about our carbon market system. I mean, first, that it's coming of age and it works. It's coming of age, it took about 12 years, which to create a whole new market, a whole new type of financial instrument. And to make it work, it's not that long. And yes, we've had uh, quite a few rough patches. But I think our latest legislation, which isn't in force yet, it's already been discounted by the market. Uh, and you've seen the price development. People have understood what we've done to make the market more stable, more solid, uh, to uh, siphon, siphon out uh, excess liquidity, and the price has gone up. We'll see how that develops. But it's working also because it covers about 45% uh, of our economy. Uh, it covers aviation in part. Uh, it, is, it has produced enormous gains in terms of efficiency of our industrial installations. And that's extremely important because that means not only uh, reduction of emission. It also means improved competitiveness, improved efficiency, means our industry is all the better for it. It works because it has huge popular support. Yes, we hear the same kind of criticism from all directions that the governor was, uh, was illustrating. That's normal, but still, we have huge support and we have very solid support from our leaders uh, at the head level of heads of state and government of our member states. The second thing I would say is that uh, it is, again, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm repeating what the governor said, but that's a fact. Uh, it is part of a system. It is part of an integrated set of policies. We have now almost finished agreeing the policies that will lead to 2030 and to a reduction of over 40% of our emissions. There's no point in our industry wanting to electrify if our electricity isn't clean. There's no point in our industry moving to hydrogen as a source of energy if we don't produce hydrogen with clean energy. And we have policies which will lead in that direction. And in a couple of months, we'll come out with our 2050 strategy that brings us, just to give one example, to a plan to decarbonize entirely our energy supply between now and 2050. And the third thing I would say is cooperation. It puts us in a very good position to cooperate with our partners, to cooperate with those who have a similar policy outlook to the one I have. And uh, it is not just out of politeness to the hosts that I say California is first and foremost among them. You can see it in what's happening on the ground. But it also has enabled us to come to a situation where ours will no longer be the biggest carbon market in the world. Our Chinese friends uh, are setting up a market which even in its initial phase, limit to power generation, will be bigger than ours. We think it's an extremely important development, and we have a very good uh, cooperation program with China. We are cooperating with all uh, uh, jurisdictions, uh, national or uh, subnational, that have a carbon market pre pricing, the so-called Florence process, where we meet to exchange views and see how we can improve our respective system. So I think you have a system which is now mature, it's beginning to work as it was meant to, it produces results, it is part of a bigger picture, and it's helping that bigger picture to come into existence, and it's part of a huge effort of international cooperation. Thank you. Ambassador Fuller. Thank you, Leslie, and my thanks to those who collaborated together with us in putting together this event, which I think is very important for enriching the discussion about how carbon pricing systems are actually working. So uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, uh, by way of background in, in Canada, uh, we put in place a comprehensive climate change plan in 2016 with the agreement of uh, our Prime Minister and 12 Canadian uh, pre premiers of provinces and territories. Uh, and that plan has carbon pricing as a key element. I'll, I'll echo what Governor Brown said in saying that carbon pricing is a, is a key element, but it is not the only, only element of that plan. Uh, pricing is complemented by a wide range of regulations, for example, on coal and methane and other areas, as well as incentives for uh, new technologies and so forth. But 
Carbon pricing is a key element. We, we fully recognize the advantages of that price signal and a market-based system. Uh, so what that agreement did was uh, establish uh, an arrangement whereby we would have a federal benchmark uh, for provincial systems, recognizing that uh, Canadian provinces have shown significant leadership in putting into place carbon pricing. In fact, uh, Quebec and Alberta and B British Columbia were, were pioneers in North America in establishing carbon pricing systems and have been operating those systems for over a decade. So the agreement was to have a federal benchmark to provide consistency and fairness uh, across the, the country. Uh, and it is complemented by what we call a federal backstop, which means that for provinces that uh, don't put into place systems uh, of their own or, or have systems which aren't consistent with the, the benchmark, uh, then the, the federal government is able to operate a system in those provinces. So in uh, the uh, uh, um, current context, uh, we're in the process of assessing provincial plans for consistency with, with the, the benchmark. Um, and uh, that benchmark, I should mention, is uh, uh, a $20 per tonne price benchmark uh, for 2019, uh, rising by $10 a year after that. Uh, and uh, we'll be indicating later this fall uh, which uh, uh, systems are cons consistent with that benchmark. Uh, and where the federal backstop will, will need to apply. Um, and, and finally, I'll just um, echo what Maura has said, that uh, certainly the evidence is there that carbon pricing works. Uh, we know, uh, for example, in British Columbia, where they've had a, a carbon tax in place now for, uh, uh, for, for a decade, that uh, uh, the, uh, the economy has grown in that period by uh, 17% uh, and emissions have been reduced by modeling estimates show uh, between 5 and 15% relative to business as usual in terms of reduction in, in emissions. So it's working, uh, uh, it's consistent with uh, uh, a, uh, 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 an approach which encourages economic growth and most importantly, innovation. And I think that is, is really uh, the key element of a price-based system. So, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Fuller and Professor Hu. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to show you some of the development of the China economy. From 2013, in the five cities, 和两个省开始了碳排放交易市场的试点。这五个城市包含北京、上海、天津、重庆和深圳市。两个省是广东省和湖北省，涉及了三千多家企业，涵盖了二十几个行业。到去年的六月份，这七个。碳市场的试点，成交的额超过了两亿吨，交易的金额超过了四十五亿人民币。从去年年底开始，中国又启动了全国统一的碳排放交易市场。全国统一的市场，哎，涵盖了呃水泥。钢铁、炼铝、石油化工、航空等八个高耗能的这样的领域，总的排放量大概占全国碳排放量的一半左右。现在，先从电力行业来开始启动，电力行业大概的排放量在三十亿吨。二氧化碳左右的规模，预计的可以潜在的减排量大概有五亿吨左右。所以，通过这样的一个碳排放交易的体系，现在正在促进重点企业来核查和上报他们的这样的一个排放量
会促进这个企业 M R V 这种体系的这样一个建设，所以现在呢正在加紧在做，一个是统计商报这样的一个体系和这样的一个平台，另外一个就是交易和核查的这样一个体系的这样一个建设，所以随着。中国这样一个碳市场的这样一个发展，就是把中国原来比较强化的，用政府规制的办法来促进完成国家的排放目标，变为由政府的管理和市场两者结合起来，来实现中国的 NDC 的目标。好，谢谢。Mr. Rod, perhaps you can give us the, the perspective from, from, from business on how this market has developed and impacted um, your OK. Companies. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, after those presentations, my, my country is the business. <laughs> um, and um, I would like to, to testify that the, the, the business has played a, an important role in favor of uh, carbon pricing over the, the, last, the last years, and also uh, in the perspective of the fight against climate change. And there was a dramatic change just before the COP21. Uh, in the, the, the previous uh, summit in Copenhagen, uh, five years later, the business was against, uh, not considering climate change as a priority. Uh, during the period preceding the, the COP21 and the Paris meeting, there was several actions. First, the creation by the World Bank of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition to favor carbon pricing as a tool uh, to rationalize the fight against climate change. And uh, the, the French government, having the chairmanship of the COP21, had asked me to to chair what was called the Business Dialogue. It was a group of 40 chief executive, international CEO, American, uh, from Latin American, from Asia, Europe, Middle East, and 40 ministers, negotiators, to prepare the summit. And the carbon pricing um, appeared to be, for the business, the, the best appropriated tool uh, instead of, instead of uh, having lots of regulation, uh, industry by industry, uh, an accumulation of regul different regulation uh, to reduce emissions, the idea for the business was quite simple. Uh, emitting CO2 is bad. It has a, a price, a cost. We have to pay for that. And therefore, it's the best way for the business to integrate uh, on a quantitative manner, the, the constraint of the, of the climate. And so we have been pushing uh, for carbon pricing systems, which had been finally integrated in the, the final decisions in the Paris Agreement. And later on, some very important moves in the world had been made. Uh, in China, in, uh, in, uh, in Canada, in Ca California leads the way and the, the resistance, congratulations, um, but also in, in, in Europe. And uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, ETS system had been created uh, at the moment of the Kyoto Protocol a long time ago, but with ups and downs and after the crisis, the financial crisis, uh, down. And the price of carbon, of the, the market, um, was dropped to two euros, five euros, which means nothing. And therefore, the ETS was no longer efficient. And the reform has been made, with, uh, to simplify the creation of a market stability reserve, a kind of a central bank for uh, certificates, and uh, with the elimination of the surplus of certificates, the price of carbon 
in the, the European market. Uh, finally, uh, uh, was climbing from five to seven, and very uh, rapidly to 2025, where it is now. And we as the business, we consider that a good price to implement the shift to the old world of energy, to the new world, decarbonized world, low carbon world, would be uh, 30, around, around 30 right now, and um, rising to, to 50 at least in uh, uh, 20, 2030. But the progress is very significant in Europe. It has been made. And we have simply to keep in mind uh, uh, what is one of the priority of the CPLC, which is to extend the scope of the countries and regions having a carbon price. Because if the European companies, which are uh, heavily uh, uh, energy consumers, uh, the cement business, the steel industry, chemical industry, are the, the only one in the world to pay a high price of carbon, there will be what we call carbon leakages. And, and the difference in competitiveness between Europe paying a high price of carbon and some other countries not paying the same price. And therefore, uh, a problem of competitiveness between Europe and the rest. And we, we, we have to, to bring a, a solution. There are technical solutions to this problem of carbon leakage. So um, I will say that the business uh, continue to support uh, uh, the, the carbon pricing because it is a, for us a rationalization of the climate. We can take a carbon price in our internal uh, investment processes, computations, um, and it is the best way to, 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 to do it. And by the way, I want to mention that some companies, and we are among that one, we are present in 70 different countries, and there is not a carbon price in 70 countries. Uh, nevertheless, when there is no carbon price, we decide to have an internal carbon price. And I will conclude by giving only one example. We, have a, we had a, a, a coal uh, power plant, a big one, in Australia, as a hazel wood. It was using lignite, and uh, it was supposed, said to be the most emitting power plant in the world. Um, when the, the Australian government decided to, to, to fix a carbon price, this plant became unprofitable. And so for economic reasons at this time, we decided to, the principle to close it down. Later on, another government in Australia decided to withdraw all the, the regulation on, on, on uh, CO2 emissions. It was going backwards. And so economically, at this time, the, the rationality for us would have been to let this plant in operation. But in the meantime, we had decided to integrate an internal um, carbon price that we impose to all our subsidiaries and with a, a, a carbon price of a, a significant amount, the decision, it was not only a decision taken for ecological reasons or for convictions, but it became a, a, a rationalization, an economic rationalization of the closing down. So we decided, without the, the governmental regulations, we decided, nevertheless, to close down this, uh, this power plant thanks to the carbon price. So carbon price is a really a, a, an efficient tool. So we've seen sort of real world examples of the impacts of the carbon price in action as you cite with this coal plant. Now before we go on, I want to just get a sense of in, who is in our audience. How many of you work in carbon trading or carbon policy specifically? Can you raise your hand? 
All right, all right, <laughs> wow. Um, and how many of you work in the energy industry or energy regulation, energy policy? Okay, terrific. Um, and how many of you just wandered in off Market Street looking for a no, just <laughs> um, Well, Gerard, you've raised the issue of leakage, and there's been a lot of discussion recently about carbon border tax adjustments. Since you are all already in this industry, you know what that means. Um, I think, uh, you know, France, Sweden have spoken more and more about the carbon border tax. And I'd love to hear your thoughts in turn on whether you've seen leakage in California, um, it, for example, uh, as a result of uh, emissions trading schemes and, and whether a uh, you know, border tax could, could work. Uh, Mary? So uh, this was an issue that was raised from the very outset of our beginning to design the program. Uh, when we operate within a country that has very strong constitutional protection, for interstate commerce. Indeed, that was one of the founding principles on which the United States was formed, was the idea that there needed to be some central authority to assure that there was going to be fair trading and currency uh, parity across the lines of the individual uh, colonies. So uh, this has been an issue from the very beginning of the United States as to whether there would be blockages or uh, barriers to trade and whether one state, by having uh, higher standards or uh, stronger regulations can impose itself on others is a very, very sensitive issue here. And it's one that we have navigated through, I think, with a lot of care to make sure that uh, we are not only allowing for the flow of products, we are, a, a, as a state, uh, trading and um, transporting things from one place to another, as well as into our own internal market, is probably our, our largest sector of, of our economy. Uh, and there was great concern that we might be doing something that would cause uh, our own uh, uh, companies, especially those in manufacturing areas, to lose uh, as a result of leakage to other places, or that there might be some uh, false accounting, if you will, for uh, California taking credit for emissions that were just being pushed to other places. And from early on in our discussions with uh, China, before China uh, really stepped up uh, in advance of, of Paris, uh, there was uh, talk about whether the United States, by importing so many things from China, was perversely causing emissions to uh, to go up uh, in communities that would have to bear the cost of, of the emissions, not just from greenhouse gas perspective, but from an air pollution perspective. And I think one of the points which uh, the governor touched on, which I would want to bring forward here, is that we have to look at the problem of emissions of greenhouse gases as part of a continuum of kinds of pollution that uh, affect communities directly. Because uh, both for political reasons, um, in terms of the impacts on those who are bearing the burden of the pollution that exists today, and also from an economic perspective, we need to be able to um, make the link uh, between uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the emissions of pollutants that more directly impact people on the ground, especially in urban areas where they breathe the pollution and uh, our people increasingly, I think, are demanding action to be taken to protect their health and protect their, their individual uh, well-being in these communities. So this is a long way of responding to your question that we look at this issue of leakage and try to account for it uh, in the system in a couple of different ways, um, one of which was to um, make sure that we in California took responsibility for emissions from power plants outside of our boundaries that were um, uh, that we import from. So California um, currently uh, receives, uh, uh, receives electricity, purchases electricity, or owns power plants in some cases of our municipal utilities. We own coal-fired power plants that are outside of our borders. Uh, how do we account for that? 
Well, uh, we came up with a way of making sure that we were taking responsibility for it, and the largest uh, owners of those coal plants, who are cities in Southern California, are in the process of now making changes to, the, uh, to those plants to convert them to um, natural gas or to reduce the usage of those plants, and not just to export the the pollution to other places. That is a kind of leakage that we think is very important. As far as a border tax is concerned, we have done some work on that, mostly um, in conjunction with the cement industry because of their high degree of international um, activities and ownerships. And we've made some progress in terms of thinking about the issue, but haven't yet uh, tried to actually uh, implement a program like that because we've been able to forestall the necessity of doing it. And I think, in general, we would prefer not to have to try to go down that route. Thank you, Mary. And M Mauro? Well, thanks. Let me first speak on something Gerard said. I think it's, it's, it's very crucial. Carbon pricing as something that makes sense to the operation of a company, not something which is simply an imposition from outside. Uh, in our economies, companies operate on pricing signals. I think it's extremely important to see that companies are beginning to realize and incorporate into their thinking that in the longer term, carbon pricing, one way or the other, is there to stay. Whatever governments do, it's becoming part of the accepted way of life for, a, for an enterprise, and the sooner you incorporate it in the way you do business, the better off you are. You are. Now, carbon leakage is germane to that. Because carbon leakage in terms of, oh, well, okay, we'll have our enterprise delocalized, is one of many factors which we've been struggling with in Europe on the issue of delocalization. The reality is that, yes, there are dangers, but they've been manageable and managed reasonably well so far, mostly through an improvement in the productivity of our industry. And I think what we are seeing, for instance, in terms of if you look at the link between carbon pricing energy efficiency and the efficiency of industrial processes, our policies have in fact encouraged our industry to become more productive and more competitive. That has been the, the biggest response to carbon leakage. Yes, we have also taken policy responses. Uh, the government was saying we've uh, given too many allowances, perhaps, but in order to make sure that our industry was reassured that uh, carbon leakage wouldn't hit them all at once, at a time when, frankly, uh, we were having competitiveness problems, there was one way to do it. Uh, we're still talking about you know, a, a span of 12 years altogether. Um, but I don't think carbon leakage is today a fundamental problem for a carbon pricing system, which is not to say that it can be underestimated. But I think we have the time to build the kind of understanding that carbon pricing is an issue which concerns everybody in the world, which concerns every consumer, which concerns every enterprise, uh, and that is the surest way to make sure carbon leakage isn't an issue. So we will continue to manage, uh, we continue to give free allocation to our industry for carbon leakage. The system is designed to make our industry perfectly comfortable with carbon price uh, uh, of 30 euros and above. Um, so we believe they are still fairly comfortable at this stage. At some point, we have to eliminate the root causes of carbon leakage, and that is only by international cooperation and by spreading the notion of carbon pricing is part of the normal way of doing business everywhere in the world. Um, a few years ago, a lot of people had some reason to doubt. I think today, you, you can see that happening. You can see that being built into the way companies operate. Companies operate in a variety of jurisdictions, I think the example Gerard gave us was, uh, was very telling. Does it make sense for a company that operates mostly in Europe and a few others, other uh, developed jurisdictions <coughs> to behave completely different in a jurisdiction that at some point, at some given point in time, decides not to have a carbon pricing? And how long before they change their mind and they do develop a carbon pricing, and where does that leave the company that hasn't adapted itself? Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue on which we have to continue to work. 
but I wouldn't find it a defining issue right now of carbon pricing. Yes, uh, I guess I would say uh, in a similar vein that uh, uh, to address uh, competitiveness considerations, uh, uh, we, we're doing two things in the approach in Canada. Uh, in the first place, uh, the, the approach that I described earlier seeks to provide business with certainty, and that is very key in terms of uh, supporting competitiveness of our, our economy. So the federal benchmark, as I spoke about earlier, is an approach to providing certainty. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, the question of design uh, of systems, and certainly Canada is an export-oriented economy, so we have to be uh, very alive to the considerations around uh, trade-exposed sectors. So um, provinces that are implementing systems have taken step steps to incorporate into the design of those systems uh, the competitiveness consideration. And equally for the, the federal backstop, uh, that also uh, takes that into account in uh, an approach which has been designed through extensive consultation with industry uh, to implement a output-based pricing system uh, that, that takes into, into consideration the, uh, the uh, competitiveness of trade-exposed sectors. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor Hu, in, in China, this seems to be less of an issue. <laughs> 和建立一个促进碳排放减少的制度是非常关键的它这个可以来投资可以提高大家节能和减少碳排放的积极性就是说你在分配碳排放额度的时候一定要比较适量的要充紧如果额度分配的过高的话实际最主要的也和国家的产业政策相联系生产能力要逐渐给它淘汰掉
测算是不太准确的。这样，通过呢，他们进入了碳市场，建立了这样一个统计、监测和上报的这样的一个系统，而且组织第三方去进行核查。这样也是一个最基本的制度的建设，这样一个 M R V 体系的这种形成，也保障了这个市场，这个碳价的它的那个透明性和它的那个公平性和准确性。所以，这个通过碳市场的这种建设，用这种碳价机制来促进减排，既是一个市场的导向。我觉得更重要的呢是促进了一个制度的这样一个建设，所以从这几个时点来看，这个进入碳市场的这些企业，他们在企业的技术的升级和对先进技术的投资方面，还都有比较明显的这样一个效果。所以现在中国在推进全国统一的这种碳市场。所以，对于未来未来的这种碳价的这个管控非常重要，就是如何来分配这个各个企业的配额，所以还要预留一部分配额，可能在未来进行拍卖，或者来进行这样的一个调节，对这个呃能够稳定这个碳市场的这样的一个价格。所以在初期呢，可能主要是以免费的发放为主，越来越多的呢，加上增加这个拍卖的这样一个份额。另外呢，除了碳市场上有这个履约的这样的一个机制之外，就是企业之间这个就是进入碳市场，企业之间配额的这个结余或者配额的不足进行交易之外。也引入了一些抵消机制，就是中国叫 CCER， 就是可核证的这样的一些减排量，是一些中小企业，比如说发展新能源或者节能产生的一些减排量，可以到市场来一部分，一般来讲百分之五到十的这样的这个这个配额的这样的一个补充来进行交易。这样的话呢，也使得这个补充这个碳市场的这样一个供需的关系，能够呢也对稳定或者降低这个企业的负担和这个碳价也能起到很大的作用。中国这个五这个七个试点碳市场的试点交易的呃这个履约的这种交易额，大概是两亿吨。二氧化碳，这个低销的大概是一点三亿吨，这个 C C E R 有，所以这个呢价格呢相对来讲，比那个履约的碳价稍微便宜一些，所以说这样的话呢，这个用一些可控的低销的机制，也起到这个稳定碳价和能够使得企业更为灵活的一些作用，同时也激励了中小企业。没有进入碳市场企业的减排，发挥他们的积极性。所以说，我觉得是我们有很多的政策的手段，可以来调控这个碳价，而且能够使它维持在一个比较合理的水平上，能够促进这个碳市场的健康的发展。好，谢谢。Thank you, Professor Hua, for that、uh, that rousing assessment.、Um, Uh, Gerard, I just wanted to ask you, building on what Professor Hua said about the, the price stability, do you feel that business has enough clarity to plan、um, based on the current current policies, or, or do you believe that more stability, more predictability, is would be beneficial in the、mm -hmm. carbon markets?、Uh, yes.、Uh, first of all, I would like to make just a few remarks.、Um, uh, it's important, and CPLC has been created in order to expand. Uh, as much as possible, the geographical scope of the countries covered by a carbon pricing system. Today, the two largest markets, carbon markets in the world, are China and Europe. And with、uh, with California and Canada,、uh, we 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 have a round the table, perhaps 
90% of the countries having a carbon price system. Nevertheless, 80% uh, of the world is still not covered. No, that's the first element. The second element, even within the, the countries having decided to have a carbon price, you have some difference, internal differences. Uh, the sector covered, I understand that China is so far focused on energy sector, when in Europe uh, we have the energy sector, we have also the cement, chemical, steel uh, sector. Um, in terms of price, uh, we are now around 25 in, in Europe. I understand that in China it's so far less than 10, and we fully understand why there is need a, a period for the, for the, the tra transition. Uh, so, nevertheless, the situation is, of course, not perfect. That's fully understandable because the situation is evolving. We have in, in France uh, uh, an, an economist, a Nobel Prize of Economy, uh, who says that uh, for carbon pricing is absolutely the must, but you need to have one single carbon price the same around the world. That's in theory perfect, so that's simply impossible. Uh, so we have to take into account those differences. And about stability, I come back to your, your, uh, your question. It's true that for the business, the business has to integrate uh, in its computation for investment uh, in energy, uh, in uh, energy efficiency, or even in investment for uh, in a steel maker, for example, they have to integrate a carbon price. But when there is a market, it's not so easy. In the past in Europe, before the crisis of 2008 and 9, the carbon price was around 20. And then after the crisis, it dropped to 2 euros. So such uh, a difficulty to, to forecast, to anticipate. Uh, one of our suggestions uh, uh, in Europe at NGE was to, to maintain the principle of a market, uh, cap and trade, uh, with certificates being uh, exchanged on the market, supply and demand, but with a flow and a ceiling and for um, a, a tunnel uh, in order to, to help and to narrow the uncertainty for the, 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 the companies. Without, uh, today, the, the, there is some doubt on the stability of the system. In the past, the, the, the system, the ETS, has not been stable and therefore its credibility had been affected. And in order to increase the credibility of the ETS system, we suggest uh, a system in, by, by which uh, there will be a flow for the, uh, the price of the emission. And, and during the auctions, the auction will not be complete if the, the auction price does not reach the minimum. That's, uh, that would be the, the rule of the system. And, it, it can work, and in Quebec it has been used like, 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 like that. Um, and also a, a ceiling in order to avoid uh, too high prices, precisely for sectors which are ex exposed to the international competition. But this, uh, this uh, tunnel, this corridor of uh, carbon price uh, will be very difficult uh, to apply to the, the 27 countries member of the EU today. So perhaps it could be implemented uh, by a limited number of countries, France, Netherlands, uh, Belgium perhaps, uh, and it would, be, it would be positive if Germany would, uh, would, uh, would, would join the, 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 the group. Uh, in order to, to give 
more visibility uh, to the economic players that is the, the business. So a floor and ceiling could help. I mean, you mentioned this idea of a single pr global price. Aha, uh -huh. Mara wants to jump in. <laughs> well, sorry, just before we go on, just one clarification. One thing is carbon pricing, one thing is the carbon market. I mean, when we talk about the drop in prices of carbon in Europe, we are also talking about the economic crisis that we went through which was particularly severe in Europe. I don't recall our stock market doing particularly well at that time. So I don't see why the carbon market could have done any better. Um, and when we talk about markets, I'm not aware that anybody is suggesting that uh, company shares should have a floor in order to prevent them from going too far down. So uh, this without detracting to the uh, uh, the proposal. Uh, what I'm saying is that one thing is carbon pricing, and if you choose a regulatory instrument to enact carbon pricing, that has a number of consequences in how the regulator manages that price, whether you do it through a tax or whether you do it through a floor or to another instrument. That's a regulatory approach to carbon pricing, which is perfectly legitimate. And to be very honest, the main reason why Europe hasn't gone that way is because we couldn't agree among ourselves. Because uh, fiscality is a national uh, prerogative. We did not have unanimity. Uh, and it was just too difficult. That's why we went for a market. But once you go for a market, you must operate it as a market, and not as a mix of market regulation. That's, I think we, we have to keep that, that very clear in our mind. And we've chosen a market. Maybe if we had the perfect institutional system, we would have made a different choice. Maybe we will make a different choice in the future, uh, depending on how politics and the institutions evolve in Europe. But today, we have carbon pricing through a market. It is now legally recognized that allowances in Europe are financial instruments, subject to the full legislation on financial markets. That's why we have to make it operate, and that's what the Commission is trying to do. Then there is the whole debate on is it working, is it good enough, is it working well enough, should we do something else? And, you know, the, the, uh, that's an open field among member states in Europe and that's a discussion which is going to rage for, for quite a while. But the important thing is that we keep in mind that the more countries have a carbon pricing mechanism of whatever kind, the better off industries in terms of predictability and that's a key fundamental policy objective of the European Union to persuade our partners that it is wise in the long term to have a carbon pricing mechanism. And then the question is for those of us who choose to implement it through a carbon market, how do we talk to each other to make sure that those markets work as well as they do, whether or not we manage to put them together and to link them? You know, the stock markets in London, in Frankfurt, or in Paris. Uh, or in New York aren't linked. The operators are the same and there is a mutual influence on prices, but they're not institutionally linked, are they? So it, I, let's not focus on, on some of the phenomena rather than the fundamentals. Thank you. And I want to open up the floor for questions in just a few minutes. So um, if you think, start thinking about your questions, would anyone like to respond? Uh, would either of you like to respond about this idea of, of link, linking the markets, as, as Mauro has just said, perhaps yes. it's not necessary? Well, uh, I agree it's not necessary, and it may be too difficult. Uh, as we've all been talking about here, just getting a program stood up and running effectively and without scandal and continuing to make progress, being able to correct any problems that emerge. These are significant things and they don't happen instantaneously. It takes time and experience just to make that work. It's also, I think, become very clear that there's the, a little bit of a tension, but it's a constructive one, between the political system and the kind of um, technocratic system, if you will, that it takes to actually run a cap-and-trade program and that you need 
interoperability, interaction between the two. There has to be the ability for the political people to understand the program well enough and support it so that they see that progress is being made, but remembering that in the context of all of this, what we're trying to do is not to um, produce more allowances, we're trying to actually reduce emissions, and this is a very different kind of market. It is not comparable to other markets that, that people are used to. Um, and at the same time, the people with the expertise in running these programs have come to see, and we are so appreciative of the Florence process for this, that we have all gone through many of the same kinds of experiences face many of the same kinds of issues, and we have slightly different ways of having dealt with them, and we can learn a lot from each other just by sharing those experiences. So um, we see this as uh, maybe it's, it has some aspects of a support group, and that's okay too, but it also uh, definitely has produced some important uh, learning, I think, for, for all of the the participants, and we've been able to include some of the jurisdictions that aren't quite there yet, but are merely thinking about it or operating a partial market and give them a place to come and uh, learn more and get more comfortable about what they may be facing as well. Uh, all of those, I think, are really valuable objectives, and it is a kind of a linkage, but it's more like a parallelism than it is forcing a, uh, a treaty kind of uh, a linkage, which definitely, as we have learned in our own experience, uh, and it takes a lot, a lot of work and um, a lot of uh, sharing of the, the burden, if you will, of facing the uh, facing all of the consequences that come with uh, starting up these programs. So, uh, but when, once once the business community uh, learns to live with the program, and uh, they they at least in our experience have become some of the greatest advocates for its continued success and, and stability. So that's really an important element. Thank you, Mary. Maybe I can just echo that just by saying that I think that uh, at this point in time, the emphasis is really on uh, promoting a wider application globally of carbon pricing through the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition in particular, which Minister Catherine McKenna is a co-chair of, uh, as well as uh, the work that's going on at a more technical level to promote alignment and harmonization around things like measurement and reporting and verification, which can down the road support uh, linkage. Uh, um, certainly, you know, linkage is positive outcome when we can get there, and we, we are there in mm -hmm. Quebec and, and California, uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of, lot of work to do to, to see that applied more, more broadly, I think. Thank you. And uh, Gerard, and then, and then questions, please. Yes, just, just a word on, on the interest to have some visibility and, and, and stability. I, I would like to speak about uh, carbon capture and storage sequestration. Uh, uh, five or six years ago, uh, lots of hopes had been put in uh, CCS uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions from existing activities. It's clear that the economic balance of the CCS is directly proportionate in proportion to the carbon price. The more the carbon price is high, the more it is interesting economically to capture and store. Um, when in Europe the, the carbon price was around 20 in the past, uh, there has been lots of uh, uh, CCS projects. And uh, uh, when the carbon price dropped, quite all the project has been eliminated. Uh, we at NG, we, we, we had the last one uh, in, uh, with E.ON, another utility. It was in uh, uh, Rotterdam uh, in order to capture the, all the CO2 emissions of uh, a big coal plant. Uh, built by E.ON. But with the drop uh, of the price, it became more and more uncertain, and at the end, this last project, even subsidized by the 
uh, EU Commission, subsidized by the Dutch government, we had, we had to, to, uh, to drop it uh, be, be, because there was no economic uh, justification. The, 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 the carbon price was too low. Now it's coming back at a high price, 25. Good. But in order to invest in uh, such a big project, this one was 560 million euros, very big project. In order to, to reconsider an investment, uh, the industry needs to have some perspective uh, and to have a trust in the market. Of course, the business prefers the market than the tax. Usually we don't like tax, uh, carbon tax or other taxes. So we prefer a, a, a system driven by the, by the market. Nevertheless, uh, to make that kind of investment, we need visibility and some predictability, at least in the, in the carbon price. That, that was the reason of my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Now I'd like to open it up for questions. Please identify yourself and please ask a question here right on the aisle in the front. I think so. Is there a microphone? No, I don't see a microphone. Oh, yes, there is. Lung power. <clears throat> There's a microphone coming to you. Brought by a very distinguished runner. Thanks, Craig. Um, Alden Meyer from Union of Concerned Scientists. A number of you emphasize the need for certainty and predictability from the business point of view for carbon pricing. Uh, but as we've learned very painfully here in the United States, elections have consequences. Uh, if you look to our north, you see the new premier of Ontario saying that he wants to get out of uh, the cap and trade regime with California and Quebec and also saying he will resist uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's federal pricing scheme, and I, and I believe the same may be true in Alberta as well as a result of the lawsuit and, and court decision on the Kinder Morgan pipeline. So I'm wondering if Ambassador Fuller could say a little bit about the outlook uh, for the pricing regime in California as a result of those changes, and Mary, if you could say a little bit about the implications for California if Ontario does pull out, and also anything you know about the position of the new Mexican president and what that might mean for carbon price. Well, actually, price. they did pull out. No, as but I they, said he's announced, own. hasn't he announced he will pull no, out? No, it's done. It's over. Okay. We're divorced. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so what's, what's the It would take legal that? action to resume the relationship. Okay, great. People well, it, it, emphasizes, <laughs> it emphasizes my point even more. What, what are the implications of these changes at the sub-federal level in Canada? <laughs> So, uh, thanks for the question. Certainly it was a question I was expecting. <laughs> and uh, really I'll just reiterate what I said earlier in terms of uh, the commitment of the Government of Canada to proceed with the plan that we put into place in collaboration with the provinces and territories in 2016, uh, which has as a, a key component, not the only component, but a, a key component, carbon pricing. And uh, the, uh, the agreement that where provinces uh, choose not to implement a, a system, that the federal government will implement a system in those provinces and return the revenue that results from that to those jurisdictions. So that is the course we're on. And uh, as I said earlier, we're in the process of assessing the uh, plans that provinces have put forward. I think you know the good news is that all provinces are talking about the importance of having a climate change plan. So that is positive. Uh, and certainly at the federal level, we remain of the view that carbon pricing is an efficient approach to climate action uh, and that it is positive for the business community to have certainty around that. And the arrangement that, that, that uh, was put in place in 2016 through the Pan-Canadian framework uh, is one which provides flexibility for provinces and territories, while at the same time providing coherence and certainty across Canada. So, so uh, we're, we're, we're proceeding along that path. 
I, I just want to add one other word, and I, I, I don't want to uh, be facetious about this, but I have been working with this cap and trade program since I came into my current position for the second time in 2007. And we actually got the program up and running despite many slips or, or questions about whether it was going to work, whether it would be feasible and so forth. Obviously, we're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. We're also very proud of the relationship that we have developed with uh, Quebec, and we do occasionally joke about it being a marriage. And it's uh, not exactly an analogy, but uh, it, it, it involves a lot of conversation, a lot of communication, uh, and some fundamental agreement about principles. At the same time that this has all been going on, again, going back to 2007, we had Waxman-Markey on the table in the United States Congress. There was a very real prospect that the United States was going to have a national cap and trade program. This passed the, uh, passed the lower house, and uh, it was uh, very close to being implemented. Um, as the speaker said, elections do have consequences, but what I've seen is that over all of that time, in the places where there was a commitment and uh, the capacity and the willingness to continue moving forward, we have been able to move forward, and we have seen really significant results, not just in terms of creating a system or a set of regulations, but of actually reducing emissions to the benefit of the planet as a whole. So in keeping with the overarching theme of this uh, event, I, I do want to um, stress that uh, we are continuing to make progress and to find ways to expand the club, and uh, that's, that's what we're here for. Thank you. Next question. Sure, right here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Peter Joseph with Citizens Climate Lobby. I want to express my deep gratitude and respect to all of you for the incredible efforts that you've made on carbon pricing and reducing emissions. However, emissions continue to rise. CO2 levels continue to rise. I had to keep my windows closed last night during my sleep in Marin County because there was a fire about 10 miles away, and I wasn't sure whether I'd have to evacuate my house in the middle of the night. So there is a real sense of urgency in the world everywhere right now. And after all this time, of cap and trade failing in the US Senate when the Democrats owned Washington, and in Europe after more than 10 years of volatility and uh, inability really to prove that emissions are going down. Is it not time to really start talking about a carbon tax, a tax as advocated yesterday in Bloomberg by former Fed Chair Janet Yellen? as advocated by George Schultz and James Baker uh, and Stephen Chu and probably people here. Isn't it time to talk about a tax that could be implemented unilaterally by any of the big emitters, China, US, the EU, with border carbon adjustments that use the economic gears of the world economy to achieve what the UNFCCC couldn't do? Thank you. What, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. I, I actually was wondering if Professor He, would you be willing to speak about this, this question of China's debate about carbon tax versus trade? You know, more than two months ago, she had went to the fine fine put to lie. Oh, fine put to lie, huh? Great. Uh, 就是碳交易和碳税，你怎你怎么看？我觉得碳交易和碳税都是这个，呃，一个这个促进减排的这样一个政策的手段。可能呢，这个用这个碳排放交易市场，它是主要是大的企业，排放量比较多的企业。这样呢，通过碳排放权交易，可以直接这个把这个信号、价格的信号能够在市场上传递。使得企业来减排，同时呢，使得这个金融企业来投资。碳税呢，可能就是一个最基础的碳价，它不仅仅是用大企业，而且小的企业和这个民众都会受到这个碳税的影响，它会
就是更加应用的面更加广泛，所以碳税和用碳市场两个政策是并不矛盾，对。如果一个国家同时采用碳税政策和碳市场的话，那么碳税就是个最基础的碳价，可能在碳市场当中有一些碳价还会更高一些。对吧？也可以采取单独的手段，或者是采用碳税的手段，或者是只用碳市场的这样一个手段。中国现在首先推进的是碳市场，这个碳税还在酝酿当中，还没有进入这个立法的程序。所以用碳市场主要是促进大企业的减排，小的企业可以用这个嗯低销量，也是部分的参与到。这个碳市场当中来，我觉得碳市场很非常好的一个优点就是，它把这个碳的信号在整个社会来传递，然后呢，激励这个企业投资和减排，特别是通过碳市场，可以把整个的这个企业碳排放的上报、测量和核查，整个 MRV 体系建立起来。这是一个最基础的应对减排的这样的一个措施，所以我觉得大家世界各国为了促进减排，一个方面就是用碳价的机制，另外很重要的也是国家的减排的目标和你国家推进的一些财政金融的一些政策，比如说中国现在对发展可再生能源，对于电动汽车。都有财政的补贴，所以这个和碳价机制也是相互结合起来，这个起推动作用。另外，我想提一点，中国现在和日本、和韩国有一个关于碳市场的一个互相之间研讨和交流的机制。这个有三个国家的主管的政府的部门。和这个研究的部门，以及这个智库和它的这个碳市场的运行部门，每年轮流在每个国家有一次交流会，也在研究互相之间如何来合作。像日本在中国的企业有一万家，这个韩国在中国的企业也有上千家，中国在韩国和日本的企业也都有几百家，就是这些。互相之间的企业当中，如何把本国它的碳市场、本国的那个嗯它的母公司，以及这个和在这个所在国的这种企业，能够在市场的机制上有一个连接？两个好处，第一呢，可以降低他们这个企业的它的负担，可以互相之间有个抵消机制；第二，防止碳泄漏，就是说它。这个国家碳价高了，它把生产可以转到那个国家。如果我们把它链接起来，这个可以避免一些碳泄漏。所以说呢，这个机制我们现在正在研讨，但是还没有一个实质性的合作，还没有。但是呢，在在研究和在探讨这个方面如何结合。Thank you. Thank you. We only have a couple minutes left, so I just like to ask the rest of the panelists to briefly respond to this question of. Tax uh, as uh, as posed, and then we'll try and take just uh, one one last question after that. Me, look, I I've explained why Europe doesn't have a carbon tax. I don't think it's a question of carbon tax. I think elections matter in many different ways. Uh, we are trying to transform our economy radically from top to bottom with trying to transform in a few decades what took us 200 years to build. It's going to happen in 10 years. It's going to happen in 20 years. If we can make it happen by 2050, uh, we can be very proud of ourselves. It's possible. But it's possible if you persuade people it has to happen. And I have to say, I don't know whether it's luck or anything else. <clears throat> if there's one issue in Europe, and I wouldn't portray Europe as a heaven of um, calm when it comes to elections these days. Uh, if there's one issue that cuts across, uh, it's climate change. Where well, there's a huge consensus at all levels, in all parties, in all segments of the population, that something has to happen. 
But if we wreck our economy in the process, it just isn't going to happen. It's as simple as that. What we're talking about here are instruments that keep our economy growing, that keep giving people jobs, that keep having economic growth, and change we do with the way we do business. We think it's possible. We're putting together the policies to make it happen. Uh, I won't tell you that um, uh, it's necessarily going to happen and it's going to be easy. So it's not a question of, of one silver bullet, like, you know, we have a carbon tax, everybody understands emissions are a bad thing, uh, and the world is a better place. Um, it also means renouncing to live the way we live, and I don't know many people are prepared to do that. Thank you. So last question, if there is one. If not, there is coffee waiting. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the green, I think, jacket on the aisle. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Femke from Carbon Market Watch. And perhaps to say thanks to all the speakers and the organizers, but perhaps also the air conditioning can be turned down a bit and help <laughs> us save on some very heat trapping F gases. Um, I had a question follow up on the discussion on uh, a carbon border tax, for example, for the cement sector, an idea apparently that's being discussed uh, in California as well as in the EU previously. Um, and given that a lot of the sort of lack of public support for, for carbon markets is also to, due to the current practice of uh, handing out free uh, rights to pollute. I was wondering perhaps if there's a, a commitment of how to phase out a free allocation and by when do you expect this to happen? Uh, I guess to all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. We are running very short on time, so I'll just have to ask, I don't know who would like to take that question. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, okay. which, could you repeat the question? Well, you could just quickly and summarize. The Look, if the question is, when we will stop giving away free allowances. Ah. <laughs> well, yeah. at some point, we'll stop giving away allowances. Yeah. Uh, we are progressively tightening the system. And with the new phase of DTS in Europe, we have almost doubled the rate at which the system is going to be tightened. As uh, I, think, I think it was you before, said so mm -hmm. the point is reducing emissions, yes. not giving away free money. Uh, but that is a system to make that gradual and bearable so that people can actually do it. There's no point in not having a mission because we no longer have an industry. We'd rather have an industry that does not uh, emit car CO2. Thank you so much. And I, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.